Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Sel Sullivan. Uh, welcome to the Empower Survivors program, Conversations with Elizabeth. Uh, Empower Survivors is a nonprofit located in Stillwater, Minnesota, that aids survivors of childhood sexual abuse in the healing process by offering Facebook peer support groups, uh, Zoom peer support groups, mentorship programs, and programs like this. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest. I'm just going to let somebody else in the room here. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest, Donna Bulletwitz. <laughs> and I'm hoping, I think you're going to have to correct me. Um, but Donna is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and has an academic PhD. She has been studying trauma and the impacts of trauma for her healing, and also so she can teach others. Donna has published some of her stories in one of our newsletters, uh, in a, so you can check that out at www.empowersurvivors.com, or .net, actually. Um, there's a um, page that's specifically for people that want to share their um, stories. It's called The Power of You, and Donna was nice enough to uh, write up a, a little tidbit for us on our website. Um, <clears throat> but Donna has published some of her stories uh, in a Survivor magazine and on a website. She has been interviewed for a New Zealand-based podcast, a radio show, and StoryCorps. She also drafted a middle-grade novel and is currently drafting her memoir. Donna has also designed and given training for pre-service and in-service teachers. So Donna's been pretty busy. So welcome to the program, Donna. It's so nice to have you. And I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you so much. And you were very close with my last name. It's <laughs> Vladowicz. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I tell you, if there's a way I can mess up a name, I'll do it. So um, almost nobody pronounces my name correctly. <laughs> so don't worry about it. I thought, you know, pre-show, I thought I had that down, but uh, but as you see, I, I didn't. So thank you for correcting me. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for your introduction. Yeah, absolutely. So tonight you were going to kind of share with us your story, and uh, which I have to say, um, you know, for any of us to hear a survivor's story, it's an honor. Um, not something that everybody gets to hear. And it's also hard for the the person that's sharing their story at time. I mean, they're, um, you know, kind of letting us into a part of their lives. And uh, so I just, again, thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start out by saying I grew up in gorgeous Montana, Ooh. where I live now. And when I was in upper elementary school, one year, all of the teachers in grades four through six were new to the school. Um, I had been reassigned from one teacher to another right before school started. I, it didn't make any difference to me because I didn't know any of them. Um, and when my brother and I went to check out that list, um, we played around on the playground and then a teacher came out. Um, she had been putting stuff in the classroom and made a beeline for me as soon as she saw me and said that I looked like I would be in her grade. And so I told her my name and she was really excited because I was in her class. Um, and she totally ignored my brother, didn't say anything to him. She had me go help her with some garbage that she was carrying and had me stand up on my tiptoes to push this um, garbage bin lid over. Now, the other side of the garbage bin was open. So the only thing I can think of for why she had me do that, my shirt rode up because I was wearing, you know, short shirt and shorts and my shorts rode up and she was looking me up and down when I glanced over at her and I didn't feel right. So I told her bye and started walking away. And she said that I was a beautiful little girl and she was looking forward to having me in her class. Mm. And when I reached my brother, we just, you know, took off running because we like to run. And my brother was like, your teacher is weird. And I was like, yeah. So I think that was right then when she decided to, that I was going to be her victim. 
um, the first day of school, she had all her desks in alphabetical order, and obviously mine was closer to the front. Um, she talked for a little bit to introduce herself. She was married, and she had children. Um, very excited to teach at the school. And then she said that she wanted to get to know us. So she had us fill out this paper and said she would go around and talk to each of us individually. And when she got to my desk, she knelt down in front of my desk, put her hand on mine, and said, you're the prettiest little girl I've ever seen. Mm. So I pulled my hand out way, and I was kind of really quiet just looking at her. I have situational mutism and always have, and I couldn't talk because she was scaring me. Sure. Um, and then she put her hand on my cheek and said, oh, are you shy, my little girl? Mm. And I nodded and pulled away from her. She just, she kept escalating what she was doing bit by bit over the next few days, including the next day when we came in, all of her desks had been rearranged and mine was now in a corner. Mm. Um, there was a bulletin board to my right. There's a bookcase behind me. There's somebody in front of me and only one person way over to my left. So that if she knelt down, nobody could really see where her hands were. And she started taking advantage of that. Um, and she groomed, she had groomed the whole community and into thinking that she was a pillar of the community. She was well known here. And she groomed my parents, calling them up uh, the first week of school, saying how, what a wonderful daughter they had and how smart I was. And she knew I wanted to be a teacher. So she asked permission to mentor me and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So she could tell everybody then at the school that she had permission to have me after school, before school, recesses, et cetera. The third week of school, she told me she had already started playing what she called games with me. Mm -hmm. um, like one game to see how ticklish I was. And then the third week, she said she was, we were going to play a new game where she would show me how much she loved me. So she closed and locked the classroom door and then she shattered me. Um, I remember picturing myself just holding pieces of myself, like trying to hold on to me and them like slipping through my fingers. Mm -hmm. I literally felt like I was shattered and absolutely in shock. I didn't understand what she was doing. Um, and after that escalated until she had groomed the school community and my classmates to get used to her being alone with me. So sometimes she would take me out of the classroom to an empty classroom or to a storage room and lock the door. Or she would keep me in at recess when, you know, people aren't, when you've got the whole fourth, fifth and sixth grade out on the playground, someone's not gonna notice that one child's missing. Mm -hmm. Or in a packed cafeteria, people aren't going to notice one kid's missing. Mm -hmm. Or she would tell um, specialist teachers that she needed me to like make up work or something. And she'd take me out of that. Um, and this went on all year. The, the other grade level teacher did see some things and did nothing about it. Um, wow. She like, she saw my teacher come out of the same bathroom stall with me. And she saw her hands where they shouldn't have been. And I even told her I didn't want to be around my teacher, which to me was telling. Yeah. Um, she said she sent me back to my teacher. Um, I told her my teacher was too handsy with me and I didn't like it. She sent me back to my teacher. Um, the principal never walked around the school. So he never saw that she wasn't, you know, that she was out of the classroom or whatever. And we had a really small class. There were only like 14 of us. Oh, okay. Um, and the other kids knew something was going on because they all called me her, not all of them, but most of them called me her girlfriend. Wow. Um, I had a really rough summer. Yeah. My, I mean, my, not with my family, my family was fantastic. It just dealing with the effects of everything that she had done. And partway through the next school year, I realized she could be hurting another little girl. Until that moment, it had not occurred to me. So I was terrified to tell on her, absolutely terrified. 
but I decided I needed to go to the school counselor and try telling her. Mm -hmm. So I dropped little tidbits of information and she did exactly the right thing. She would ask me to tell her more. She would follow up on what I said. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually told her a tiny little bit and then burst into tears because I was so scared. Um, she told me, asked me, you know, she said what she'd heard and asked if that was correct. And I said, yes. And she said, do you, you know, that sexual abuse, right? And I nodded and wow. she said, um, she asked me if more had happened and I nodded. She asked if I wanted to tell her and I just shook my head because at that point I couldn't say anything more, but she called my parents and she called the police and my parents were fantastic. The first thing that they said, both of them, when they saw me, is that they were so very sorry. They hadn't seen what was going on and that they believed me. Wow. That is awesome. I was very lucky. Yeah. Um, and then went to the police station for the police interview. And the detectives weren't very kind. I couldn't have a parent with me. Um, they told me a woman would not molest a girl. Mm -hmm. They said, especially not her, they knew her. Um, and I said she was a pillar of the community. She had a husband. There's no way she would have done it. And so I kept trying to tell things. And then they started making fun of me because some of my memories were fragmented. And they said that if it really had happened, I would remember 100% from start to finish. And that's not the case. Absolutely. So I started thinking something was really wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I dissociated a lot of times while she did it. So, like, some of my memories are for me, like, looking up from on the ceiling. And, down. Mm -hmm. and they told me that was impossible. And so I just stopped talking to them. Then a little bit later, um, she had been suspended from school with pay for an investigation and like a week later or so and they wanted to interview me again and they said I needed to make sure I was telling the truth because she had threatened to harm herself and if she did it would be my fault and I almost recanted Donna I'm so sorry I don't mean to interrupt you but that is a horrible horrible thing to be putting on a child. I I agree. Um, I almost recanted because of course I didn't want her to hurt herself. Sure. I just wanted her to not hurt other little girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't ask me the questions they should have. Like a very basic question police are supposed to ask is, are there any identifying marks mm -hmm. and, you know, on her body? And there were, and I could have told them about them. But I didn't know to offer that. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't interview people who they should have interviewed. They did a, you know, awful investigation. And of course, she got away with it. Wow. And when she was allowed back into her classroom, one of the students in there who I knew told me that she said that she had been gone because Donna Bolatowicz lied about her. And she encouraged them to let me know how they felt about me. So needless to say, some students bullied me. And she also passed around, started passing around papers to my teachers. And this happened until I'm, you know, through my first year in college. She was up at the college a lot and she found out um, who my teachers were and all that. And she would pass around papers saying that I was crazy that I made up these lies, that they needed to watch out for me, et cetera, every year until I moved over a thousand miles away at 19. Um, and so I lost out on a lot of things because I had teachers who were her friends who were mad at her. Like I was one of the, I can't remember if it's national merit, commended or semi-finalist. It's been too long mm -hmm. for my test scores. And I had really good grades. I never got into trouble at school, but I didn't make the National Honor Society. Mm -hmm. 
And when I asked the two teachers who were in charge of it why I didn't make the National Honor Society, they said that I knew perfectly well why, that they couldn't let somebody with my reputation on the on National Honor Society. And I looked at them and I was mad. I was wow. you know, seven, 16 or 17 years old and furious with them. So I looked at them and I said, you might want to think about who's more likely to be telling the truth, the child who doesn't say anything against the adult or the adult who is harassing a child. Exactly. And you might want to think about why you're helping her. And I walked out of that classroom. Wow. Um, they did let me on the next time. But by that point, you know, the scholarships that were particular to that were gone. Sure. So I missed out on that chance. I played flute in the band and my first year, my freshman year in high school, I made second chair, which is a really big deal. Oh yeah, it is. Um, and everybody figured I would be first chair as soon as that senior who was in first chair graduated. Mm -hmm. Well, she was friends with the assistant band director. He was in charge of deciding chair placements. After her paper went around, he moved me to second row and I could never get up again. Um, and he started taking the chair tryouts private, like before we did them in front of the whole band. Mm -hmm. And he started doing it privately because some people started saying, wait a minute, Donna played be best out of everybody. Why isn't she up there? So then he had us do it individually one at a time so that nobody would hear what, who played what and object. But I lost out on scholarships that, you know, could go to the first chair sure etc um this was her way of getting back at me she had threatened to ruin my life and so she was doing her best to do that she really defamed I mean she really defamation a character and it, do you mind if I make a few comments before no not at all uh, first of all thank you so much for sharing I just wanted to give you a chance to take a breather here too. Cause that's, that's, you know, as you were um, describing this and all the hell you went through I, in my head, I'm just thinking red flag, red flag grooming, you know, it's amazing that you and your brother knew almost immediately, like your gut was telling you something. And I think a lot of times kids, um, you know, we get taught not to listen to our gut and I mean, your gut was really saying something. Um, and then I noticed, you know, her taking you and isolating you. I mean, um, you know, in, in the different things in your story where it's pretty evident that the grooming was happening. Um, also, uh, when you said tickling, um, so many times I've heard from survivors that, you know, the perp had had, you know, made a game out of tickling and that was an intro. Um, another thing, and I think we've talked about, we talked about it a little bit before, um, this idea that women don't abuse. I mean, we know that obviously that's not true. Your story proves that that's not true. And I think so many times we think of perpetrators as being men, but it really is um, cutting out a whole section of population that does abuse that are female. And, um, you know, listening to your story, listening to how police handled it. I mean, I mean you know, I know this was, I, I don't know your age, but I'm assuming this is a little, um, you know, I mean, you were in grade school, you said. And I'm thinking, unfortunately, and I know, you know, our, you know, a lot of things are, you know, a lot of people out there still need to be educated on, on trauma and sexual abuse. Um, but it makes sense that with disassociating, you know, we think sometimes that somebody should be able to recant a story from beginning to end. And it's not like a book. We, you know, we we remember in sections because our brain has a way of of um, jumping in and, and protecting us. And so to me, it makes 
makes real sense and absolutely that you wouldn't be able to tell a story from beginning to end, that it would be sectioned off. And, and, you know, and part of that was dissociating and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I'm so sorry that you, you went through that and, and didn't have the police backing you. And, and I was also amazed too, um, that your family was supportive. Um, so often that's not the case. And so I'm really glad to hear that, that they were supportive. Um, but I kind of cut you off here, but I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of take a breather too. And, and, uh, you know, just kind of point out those things that, you know, here you are telling your story and, you know, boom, 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 uh, you know, this all makes sense to, especially to us survivors. Um, and then the fact that other people saw this and said nothing. And it actually reminded me of, of cases where it's a priest. I used to work at a law firm and, and people had this thought, oh, well, clergy would never do that, or this person here is a great coach and would never do that, or, you know, and so you hearing the same thing, it's this fallacy that people have made up in their minds, and I just, I was kind of um, blown away by how you as a little girl had so much strength. I mean, the fact that you knew, hey, this is sexual abuse. And and you you tried to advocate for yourself. And unfortunately, you know, people, the officials um really let you down. And I'm I'm sorry about that. That's you deserve support. But you brought us up to um talking with the police and, and then in college and not getting those, um, you know, being able to get scholarships and this sort of thing because of lies and because of people's ill behavior. Um, what happened, you know, further on there? Um, I want to answer Mary's question really quickly in the oh, chat. Oh, good. Okay. She asked if I know of any others that this teacher abused, and yes, I do. Um, she had told me that she had played the same games with a younger family member that she played with me, a female family member. Um, and then she was, uh, after I had moved away, a couple years after she no longer was teaching elementary and mm -hmm. what I heard. So I can't verify this um, unless I looked at her personnel file and I can't do that um, was that she was pushed out of the elementary school after too many little girls complained. I don't know what that number is. Mm -hmm. One should have been enough. Um, but other people who I know who knew her had heard rumors that um, some little girls or several little girls had accused her of that. And that's why she had to leave the school district. There's no way that she had to leave because of me nine years after I told on her. So I know there were others. I just don't know how many. Um, and she is dead now, so she is not hurting anyone else. So that's a good thing. Um, especially since in her obituary, it had said something about her opening a daycare, like she was going to open a daycare center or something. So thank goodness. Sorry, but thank goodness she's dead. Absolutely. Saved a lot of people. Um, one other thing, when you brought up defamation that I had forgotten to mention that happened when I was a teenager is she sued me and my family for defamation. She said, I lied about her and that I told everybody I was ashamed of being sexually abused by a woman. Sure. Um, it was a very homophobic area and people were calling me very nasty names. So I wasn't going around telling people like she claimed she was the one who told people that I accused her. And then she got mad at me for them knowing. And um, I mean, that adds another layer of trauma. 
It it absolutely does. Um, my parents countersued. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned me being strong. I get my strength from my family. Um, I honestly think without my family, I would not have been strong enough to survive all of this. Sure. Um, and that includes my extended family who knew. Like my grandparents were supportive of me, my on both sides of the family and any of my relatives who knew were supportive. So I lucked out with my family of origin. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's where I get my strength is from them. It's and awesome. anyway, so we countersued and I had to do a deposition. They wouldn't let my mom in with me and her lawyers were horrible. But after the day long deposition, my lawyer pulled me aside and told me, first of all, what a great job I had done. He was really proud of me. He is a great lawyer. Um, he truly believed in me and he wanted to make her pay for what she did to me. Sure. Um, Good. He also said that he was pretty sure her lawyers were, he said, excuse me, crapping their pants <laughs> because he said they now know I'm telling the truth. And he predicted it would be wow. dropped. And it ended up being dropped if we dropped ours. And my parents didn't want to put me through court. So they dropped theirs. Um, But before that, she actually, um, she she refiled each time a judge threw the lawsuit out. Mm -hmm. So she was at the courthouse refiling and a reporter from a local newspaper was there. So they saw the lawsuit. And... um, Obviously, since I was a minor and have an unusual last name, my name couldn't be in the paper. Neither can my parents. Mm -hmm. But her name was sure plastered all over that article about that lawsuit where um, they mentioned that she was accused of sexually abusing a girl. And that was like, I can't remember if it was on the front front page or the front page of the local section. But anyway, it was big news and it was her own fault. Absolutely. So I was like, serves her right. She, if she hadn't been doing that, she wouldn't have gotten in the paper. Exactly. And she, um, she's lucky that's all that. Oh, was goodness, yes. And obviously she was never arrested or charged with anything for the other, for whoever else came forward. She got away with it each time, but I'm pretty sure she was sociopathic. She was exceedingly charming. Sure. And she would like have a demeanor of absolute sweetness while she was stabbing somebody in the back or you know defaming somebody like we know a lot of perpetrators do absolutely Mm -hmm. so I had obviously after she started molesting me I no longer wanted to be a teacher but then my first year in college I realized I didn't want her to take anything else from me I'd wanted to be a teacher since kindergarten so until she molested me. So why was I going to let her take it from me? So I became a teacher, an elementary teacher who kept an eye on colleagues and everybody else. I lucked out to have a wonderful school. um, My second school that I taught at just absolutely phenomenal school where families were invited after they had gone through safeguarding training. I mean, this was back in the early 2000s and they had Say all the teachers had to go through safeguarding training. All the volunteers had to go through safeguarding training, but parents and guardians were required to volunteer at the school. So we had so many adults keeping an eye on everything who had already been trained to protect children that I loved. I loved that school. I felt so safe there and like something w- couldn't happen because of all those eyes. Absolutely. I mean, really like, made a safe environment for children. A hundred percent. The only time I was ever without another adult in my classroom, I think, was state testing. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there was always at least one other adult in my classroom and same with every other classroom in that school. Absolutely. So um, I want to talk later more about things people can do at schools to help kids. I did not realize I still had healing to do until... About a year and a half ago, when I started having dreams of my abuser, she had died by then. She'd been dead for a while. And in these dreams, she was telling me she was really sorry um, Mm -hmm. and that she loved me. Um, But those dreams and all the stuff that started 
it started stirring up in me. I was like, I still have to heal. Absolutely. So I started going to therapy. I talk therapy at first. And then my sister-in-law suggested EMDR. So I was doing both. Sure. Those have been hugely helpful. I'm doing some somatic therapy now. Um, I finished with EMDR for the moment anyway. Mm -hmm. I learned how to do art journaling. I create my own art journal pieces and those have been so incredibly healing. Like I have one where I did things that people had said to me when I was younger about the abuse, like sure. what the police said, everything like that. I wrote it out in colored pencil on a piece of paper and then I covered it with um, paint and then I drew heart shapes on it and drew what should have been said to me, wrote what should have been said to me with acrylic pens in I those heart shapes. That. Um, Just things like that really have a huge impact and help me heal along with creating trainings for pre-service teachers and for current teachers. Um, I gave my first training for teachers at the state educator conference. I had an online and an in-person one. The online one had so many participants that crashed the system for online. Really? Good for you. <laughs> yeah. That's so, awesome. Thank you. It shows that those trainings are desperately needed. Yes. Um, so I've based on feedback, et cetera, I have redesigned the trainings and would like to present them again this year, the different versions more in depth and sharing my story has helped so much to take away the shame that I still felt. And for the longest time, I felt responsible that she had other victims when I found out, but I've learned that is not my responsibility. Absolutely. And you told, I mean, even if you didn't tell, it's still on the perpetrator, but Absolutely. I definitely understand that shame. Absolutely. I still have some shame about some things, but I'm working on handing it back to her. And I like have drawn like for one of my art journal pages was me taking this ball of gray scribbles and handing it right back to her. <laughs> I love that. Isn't, um, I, I mean, using art and, and journaling is just an incredible tool. I love that. I love that you have, have done that. Thank you. And another thing that's been very healing is, you know, she knew exactly what to target because she knew what I loved. So she like really got my, you know, some of my English teachers, not all I've had, I had some great English teachers, um, and had them like trash my creative writing and all that kind of stuff. So that I hated creative writing, which I had started, you know, like my mom found a paper the other day with a story that I had told her about a picture that I drew when I was four, you know, mm -hmm. I started writing early and liking stories early. Um, but I quit liking them. However, sure. last November in 20 days, I wrote 60,000 words for a draft of a middle grade story. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it's one that I know will start filling several gaps in the literature. I know children's literature very well because that's my area of research and expertise. Plus I was on and chaired a prestigious national children's book award committee. I was on the committee for three years and then chaired it for two. So I've read thousands of kids' books and wow. no gaps in the literature well. Um, I'm excited for this. Working on my memoir is healing. I started doing some crafts that she had done with me that then I didn't want to do much anymore. Mm -hmm. I've now you know, reclaimed those. I've reclaimed my voice. I love it. And I'm just so grateful you're giving me the opportunity to share my story and healing right now, too. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I It's an honor for me and to be able to have you here tonight. And, and it just kind of blows my mind when someone such as yourself, and, I, and I'm a survivor, too, um, but takes this horrible, horrible thing that happens and somehow navigates through that, processes, processes it. I mean, I think we, you know, we're healing um, sometimes our entire lives. I mean, I think I, I will be myself. 
Um, but just taking something that's so horrible and turning it around. And now you're, I mean, first of all, as a kid to speak up, I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, something like that. I just, I never did. And, and I mean, to have that voice at such a young age and then to reclaim some of these things that she took from you and say, you know what, I'm, I'm getting these things back and this is who I am and I'm doing it. And I really loved how you said that when you started teaching, and in teaching, you know, other teachers how to keep students safe, having two people, two adults instead of just one. And I think so often in programs, especially for kids, there's there's too much one on one opportunity. And there's so many things that we can do as adults to protect children in a school setting or, you know, whether it's a school setting or, or the home or somebody else's house. Um, but I think that is just amazing. And I really look forward to um, seeing how this goes with some of these trainings and, and, uh, and your, uh, you said you were doing like a teen novel. Did I um, I, middle grades is actually a children's novel. It's designed for kids like typically fourth through seventh, maybe eighth grade. Uh -huh. Mine is more specifically geared toward kids in the fourth through sixth grade range. Okay. Because that's the age I was sure. when that happened. So yeah, um, I'm gearing the novel for that. And then my memoir is adult, of course, but I have an idea for it. Oh gosh, I have so many ideas for books, middle, middle grades, teens, or young adults, books, mm -hmm. adult books, picture books. I want to write picture books that um, can help keep my, like specifically for my nephews sure. to teach them about this um, yep. and staying safe. They've had, their parents have already talked with them, but they both love books. So they might listen more to a book. Absolutely. And so it's so needed. Absolutely. Um, Mary has a good question about what is in place for kids in school when they tell. Are schools prepared to handle the situations appropriately? Um, I think mostly no, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. um, some schools do a phenomenal job of this. Mm -hmm. They have excellent trainings. Um, like that school I was in, we were very well trained on what to do. Um how to respond to kids, how to ask questions that are not leading, sure. such as tell me more yeah. or what happened then, or I don't quite understand what you're saying. Can you explain what you mean by that? Different things like that, um, geared specifically for the child and the situation, of course, but asking those open-ended questions mm -hmm. to show the child that you're listening. Additionally, your body language has to show that. You can't, Absolutely. you know, like be grading papers or shuffling papers or cooking dinner or something. When a kid is telling you something that's important, you know, turn off that burner. You can always start it again later, you know, go down to the child's level so that you're not towering yes. over them. I love how you said, um, you know, tell me more. It just kind of is a nice invitation. It's a, it, it opens the door for them to, I think, feel safe and be able to say something. And it, do you think, I mean, it sounds to me like the school was as safe as it was where you worked at because of you. Um, some, a lot of these things were in place before. Oh, okay. But, um, there were things that like when we did the trainings that sure. I would add on, I never told anybody why, mm -hmm. but I would add on, I think this would be really helpful. I think this would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if something came to me later or if I saw something, I we had weekly faculty meetings. So I could always nice. bring it up in the weekly faculty meeting. Sure. Hey, I was, you know, I noticed this situation. We really need to have a policy in place because we don't. Yeah. Or um, I saw this. We need to have this policy in place. Yes. And I mean, like I was lucky with the principals I had at that school. I had two different principals. They're both phenomenal, both women. Um, and they, they listened very well. 
and the faculty, they, their whole goal at that school was to create a sense of family among the faculty, among in each classroom sure. and among all the grades. And oh that also helps prevent abuse because if you see a close, if a predator sees a close knit community, mm-hmm. that will be harder to get a child alone. Absolutely. And the, and you're providing, I, you're giving them safe adults. I mean, Absolutely. if there's abuse in the home, if there's abuse, you know, wherever it is, they're knowing that, you know, this is a safe space at school and these teachers are, are people you can approach and trust and, and tell your story to. Absolutely. Um, some other important things for schools to keep kids safe is they should have appropriate for each grade level, a specific curriculum in place to teach sexual abuse, education, and prevention. It can yes. start at kindergarten with consent. You ask, mm-hmm. can I give you a hug before you hug somebody? Mm-hmm. Can I hold your hand before you hold someone's hand? You know, start off basic like that mm-hmm. and teach them consent, et cetera, all the, and build on it each year and let them know what sexual abuse is. Um, a lot of schools do not have those trainings in place. Mm-hmm. Um, Aaron, Aaron's law is designed to have that in place where all yes. schools K through 12 need to have that curricula, but so many schools don't. That's even in thing. states that have passed yes. Aaron's law. Mm-hmm. Um, we also, they also need to have a policy that the principal as much as, and or, vi- and or vice principal as much as possible needs to randomly go into classrooms. Absolutely. They need to walk around the schools and every teacher's classroom needs to be visited as much as possible, but at random times of day. So if you go K through six, one time, you start with second the next time, or you start with sixth or fifth or fourth or whatever. Um, And those random times, if she, I think if she had known the principal was, if the principal had ever gone out of his office, really, um, if she had known the principal would be doing that, I think she would have been scared to have me taken out of class at the very least. Maybe not during recess or whatever, but I think it would have cut down on taking me out of class and leaving the class alone. Um, Another thing that they need to do, uh, two adults is ideal for every classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not necessarily realistic given the situations right now. Sure. But it is ideal, as is a rule that you are never one-on-one with a child Mm -hmm. unless you are near an open door where everyone can see you. You know, um, I don't know if you're, if you've ever heard of darkness to light, Mm -hmm. um, but that was one thing that they really stress in their training too, having the door open, having two people. Um, And I really like that you said that you don't just give the message once in school and leave it. You're doing it every single year. It's because it's it's something that we need to keep having put out there for kids. I mean, so to to do it every year like that or to, you know, come back and and teach a little bit more is just really giving those kids some tools and 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 really um really keeping them safe that's incredible i absolutely agree and another thing like there are schools in my old school district mm-hmm. where either they have like one teacher bathroom and it's way on the other side of the school. So teachers almost have to use the kids' bathrooms. That oh, should not occur. Okay. Yes. I mean, like teachers don't have enough time to go to the bathroom. As an elementary teacher, I can vouch there are some days where I didn't have a chance to pee from, you know, 7.30 a.m. until after yeah. school. And that's not okay for teachers either. That no. didn't happen a lot. But there were situations like that where it occurred. And these schools have so few recesses, et cetera that teachers really do have no option but to use the children's bathroom. And I know some people who are incredibly uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be incredibly uncomfortable. And it just, you know, my, that was my elementary school. And my teacher would often pull me into the stall with her, et cetera, um, because she was in that bathroom with me. And I'm sure she did that to other victims too at her next. Sure. 
which they gave her a younger grade level and a school with more hiding places. After I told on her, we had the school district had open concept schools where there aren't even doors to classrooms. They could have sent her to one of those. Oh, yeah. But instead, they sent her to one with even more hiding places. Um, and and so why. things like that, you shouldn't have hiding places in your classroom. Like somebody should be able to look into your classroom and see every part of your classroom and see where the kids are. That doesn't mean you don't have a reading nook, but your reading nook should be open facing the door. Absolutely. Not hidden behind anything. Like somebody yes. should glance at your classroom and see where every single person is. Yeah, I it, that made me think of, you know, I worked at a school for a little while and they used to have like, and, you know, I like the idea, um, but I thought without people really paying attention, they had this like little house. It, it looked like a little house, a little tiny house, but it was way off on the other side of the playground. And to me, that was like a huge red flag. And eventually I did go to the administration. I said, you know, that's, it's not safe. You know, we got adults here. We have kids here. Um, you know, I like the idea that, you know, you know, it's kind of a fun little thing to have out there, but it also, um, you know, because the way it was facing, you, you didn't have adults that could keep an eye on it. And then you didn't have enough adults out there to have that two person safety rule. So um, everything you're saying, just it, it's, it's exactly what we need at our schools. I just love that. Mm -hmm. Now you're taking and teaching other teachers too. Thank you. One last tip that I think is super important for teachers in the classroom is People should be able to, when they glance in from the door, see behind your desk and you should not have stacks of things on your desk. My um, teacher had positioned her desk in such a way and had stacks of books at strategic places sure. so that she could literally have me stand behind her desk. There could be kids, other kids in the classroom and she could molest me. And nobody knew why I was standing there crying while she was smiling. And that's um, so important that you pointed that out. Um, because, you know, I hear adults say all the time, they're like, well, so-and-so didn't have the opportunity. And I said, people that want to harm kids, they'll do it right in front of you. I mean, with the, you won't even know. I mean, mm -hmm. there's whether it's they're swimming with an adult, whether it's they're, you know, having them sit on their lap, which was something that we said, you know, you know, in the school that I was at, you know, it, that isn't something that we can have because too many times um, there's somebody in a position of power that could abuse a child. Um, yeah. Absolutely. She held me on her lap a lot. Yes. Um, and held me in her arms like I was a toddler or something. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's the, another thing is some schools go way overboard and say, you absolutely cannot hug a child. That's not yeah. good for kids who need hugs. Or yeah. if they go up to an adult and hug the adult, that feels rejecting if the adult does yes. not hug them back or does not say, can we do a high five or a handshake or something like that? Mm -hmm. Um, it should all, they should always ask consent for mm -hmm. kids. Um, and it's totally okay if they don't want anything. But, you know, if a child initiates a hug, hug them back. Yeah. it That should be okay. Don't go to the extreme of you can't even touch a child because, you know, kids skin their knees. There's no yes. nurse. You're going to put a Band-Aid on a kid's knee when they skin their knee. You are going to, you know, you've got a kid crying and they run to you and they hug you. You're going to hug them back to comfort uh, them. Yes, absolutely. And so don't go overboard trying to say no touching that's not I, healthy either it i like that consent. you made yes i like that you made that point because i think sometimes um in including the school that i had been at um it started to go way the other way and i'm like we want to keep people safe we want to keep these children safe but there's also human connection and, you know, like you said, a child falls down and is crying or maybe missing, you know, their parent and, and they're really having a hard time adjusting. 
um, you know, and they come up and give you a hug to just reciprocate, um, you know, that isn't abuse. And, exactly. and so, you know, that was something that I, I was trying to stress as well. Um, so I really like that you, you know, also put out there that, you know, we're all humans and, and we also need that connection. The kids need to have someone that notices that they're hurt and gives the appropriate response. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I had forgotten to mention mm -hmm. that shows you how bold that teacher was, she found out like right at the beginning of school that my dad was a social worker. Okay. Um, my dad was not only a social worker, he was one of the people who started the sexual abuse task force in our county. Really? Went around the state with one of the other people who had helped start it, um, training other counties on how to do it. And she knew that I knew I, my brother and I had been taught when we were young, what sexual abuse was, but every material showed a man, usually yes. a creepy man. Mm -hmm. And it focused, you know, this was, I'm going to date myself. This was the eighties. <laughs> sure. And it was like, there was a bit times of, it was like the big stranger danger time. Yeah, everybody so, thought it was the nasty looking man on the street corner. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I couldn't understand what she had done was that what she was doing to me was sexual abuse. And actually, she's the one who made me realize it because yes. she told me after one incident of abuse toward the beginning that now she understood why people enjoyed sex. That was the best sex she ever had. And I was like, oh, it's sexual abuse. Um, but that's how I put that together. I didn't realize that's what it was. I, you know, I was in gifted and talented ed. I was very advanced in my classes and I didn't put that together. Absolutely. I had a dad who taught about it. I had, I mean, like it was talked about in my home mm -hmm. and he actually, I was a brat, um, I had asked him to come in and do a training on sexual abuse prevention to no, my I'm class kidding. Um, because I was pissed at, excuse my language, but I was pissed off at the teacher for, oh, go for it. and <laughs> I thought that it would be really interesting if my dad came in and I was desperately hoping somebody would realize what she was doing to me. Yes. Um, yeah. And so she couldn't say no. She huh. was furious with me, but she couldn't say no. So he came in and he taught my class what sexual abuse was and how to tell and everything like that. And she was just standing by the wall by me with her arms crossed and her head down and looking very angry. Um, but she couldn't say no. You know, I'm kind of surprised, you know, that I mean, because the 80s, yeah, they talked about stranger danger, but there really wasn't discussion. And I mean, at least in the schools around my area, there there wasn't discussion about sexual abuse. Um, there usually wasn't either. But my dad, my brother's teacher, my brother's a couple years younger. Mm -hmm. His teacher found when she found out what my dad did, she asked him to come in and talk to her class. Mm -hmm. And so he made it, it appropriate level for that class mm -hmm. he was really good at doing it at the right age the right yeah. developmental age for the kids mm -hmm. um and so that's when I asked him to come into mine um but he was my dad was very well known mm -hmm. here um as a very good social worker sure so it's not like the principal could have said no okay yeah and it's not like the teacher, my teacher could have said no. So, wow. um, I, as I said, I lucked out with the family that I have. So then because would you say, I mean, that, that seems like, I mean, what you went through was horrendous. So no child should ever go through that. But do you feel that because your dad was so in tune to this, because you had conversations about this, that as a child, do you think that was kind of the saving grace that you felt like, hey, I can come forward? Absolutely. I truly believe that played a role. That wasn't Absolutely. something I 
thought about at the time. Oh, yeah. But as an adult looking back, if I hadn't known what it meant to tell on somebody or why it was important to tell, mm -hmm. or if I hadn't heard, you know, over the years about telling on an abuser, yeah, I don't know that that would have entered my head because she had threatened to kill my pets. She had threatened her in my life. She had told me my family would abandon me and never love me again because I seduced her and all kinds of other lies. You know, the typical. Sure. Um, I mean, you hear that so many times from, per, you know, perpetrators saying things like that. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I don't I, like for myself, I don't remember anybody ever even talking about sexual abuse. And, and so there wasn't that like, oh, I can go tell somebody because I didn't even know what it was. And right. I, think the, I think that's really awesome that there, you know, even though, like I said, it's a horrendous, but there is something that made you know at a certain point, I'm going to say something. Absolutely. Well, the trigger for me truly was my fear that she would do it to somebody else. I did yeah. not want her to hurt anyone else. Um, there is a question about when in the chat about when the physical contact ended the last day of school. Okay. Um, she had told me prior to that, that I needed to come over to her house that summer. She lived not very far from me. Mm -hmm. um, she knew where I lived. She frequently drove by, et cetera. And she said, she made me memorize her birthday, her address, her phone number. And her birthday was not long after school ended. And she told me that the best birthday present would be me coming over. I'm I actually didn't... glad she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am too. <laughs> I, you know, I, I want, you know, I don't wish death on people, but I'm, she's one person that I am glad is dead. Uh, that's she, unbelievable. She had also told me she wanted to kidnap me and take me up into the mountains. She said she knew a place in the mountains where nobody would find us. And with our mountains here, that's incredibly plausible. Sure. sure. Um, so I was pretty scared. Um, and the day went the last day of school after I got home, I threw away all my gifts from her. I didn't want anything to do with her again. I mean, she had gotten me gold jewelry and that went in the trash. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause I wasn't thinking as a kid, you know, as a kid, I wasn't thinking, Hey, this is worth the money. I was thinking, yeah. I want this away from me because she gave it to me. Um, but yeah, I did not want to go over to her house. And I was furious with her too, because she had lowered my grade in my best subject. I had always gotten A pluses and A's on everything. Mm -hmm. um, and she gave me a B plus in English language arts, which was my top subject by far. Sure. And when I asked her why, because I was so mad, I found out like right at the end of the last day of school, mm -hmm. she said that it was because I wasn't obedient to her. Um, I think as an adult, and I could be wrong about this, but I think she had hoped that we would fight that grade mm -hmm. and that she would then get to see me again. Sure. Um, but it all it did was make me madder at her. Yeah. And ensure yeah. I definitely wasn't going to go over to her house. <laughs> so in, in all this, uh, you're in all that has gone on, what do you think has been in, and I know you talked about that you did EMDR and now you're doing somatic work and, and, uh, for people that don't know what somatic work is, it's, um, what your, what your mind does remember your body does. Um, so working on, and you'd be a better one to explain that, but what, what do you think was the biggest thing that helped you on your healing journey? No longer keeping her secrets. Yeah. Cause I had shut down again because of all of the harassment from her. Yeah. I stopped talking to people about it. Um, and that, I mean, that continues adult. Rarely I would tell somebody. Sure. That well, and if I you're getting bullied, 
Yeah. Mm. Well, and the lawsuit scared me and all that. So mm. even after she died, I kept her secrets and I no longer wanted to. I mm-hmm. it was the only person who benefited from that was her. Yeah. So, so then now, so you're, you're working on some uh, different programs to teach uh, teachers and other adults, how to keep kids safe. Um, your memoir is, do you, is that still in the works or? It's you still in the works. It? I, ha- I, okay. I have a long way to go with it. <laughs> okay. That's all right. You got a lot of time, huh? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you when you do, you'll have to let me know and I'll be first in line to, to get that. I'm wondering, uh, is it okay if we open up for questions or? Absolutely. And uh, you were so good about checking on the chat. I was so intrigued by you. I, I forgot that part of part of what I'm supposed to do is actually monitor the chat. So thank you for <laughs> uh, not only telling your story, but also watching the chat and, and answering those questions. Um, if anybody did have a question, uh, Donna uh, said that she is um, open to having uh, questions or thoughts. Um, when I when we open it up, generally I say let's stick to to our guest and and uh, because tonight is really her night. But if there's things that you have questions about or or comments of support or something like that. Uh, please uh, feel free to do that. Also, if you're a little nervous to do that on tape, um, go ahead. You can put it in the chat and uh, we can get them there too. Oh, I didn't see this. Okay, so um, one of our attendees said, I will be doing a presentation on revealing secrets and skeletons in the closet. Well, that sounds right up your alley, Donna. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I, that's wonderful. Um, Mary, you had uh, your hand raised. Um, yeah, you said something early on about, I thought I heard you something. Did you say something about autism or autistic? What, what was that that you said? I don't remember off the top of my head, but I am autistic. So... Um, some of the ways that my brain works are a little bit different Mm -hmm. than a listics. And I think some of that, because I have part of my autism is a very strong, from the time I was little, a very strong sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Like I can't stand it when there's not justice. And so that also is part of why why some I do this some of the things I do I never got traditional justice but I'm making my own justice I love that I think the the reason I was asking is because I suspect that my one well he's the only great grandson I have is autistic I don't think his parents or my daughter and her husband uh, recognize that and the sep- susceptibility of a child that is autistic. When you said that, I, I'm sometimes hard of hearing, so I wasn't sure I caught that. Um, and I do, I mean, even if, so I have a great grandchild and a grandchild and they're both the same age within two weeks of one another, they're two <laughs> and the difference in them and their personalities and all of that. So I don't want to compare them but I am concerned about the, I'm concerned for both of them, but the one who seems autistic. And so one of the things that I'm observing is that his repetition, his obsession, opening, closing, opening, closing, and they kind of um, give him a lot of attention in doing that. And I was wondering if they should maybe try and redirect when he's, doing that. And that's probably a whole different subject here. It It is a different subject, but um, I don't, you know, he's, he's very young and can't articulate why he's doing that. But sometimes the repetition stuff is actually self-soothing. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And so if like, for me, um, part of my stimming is twirling my hair. 
Sure. Or like I was holding on to a little figurine here and playing with it. Um, well, I was talking because that helps me self-soothe. That helps me regulate. Okay. Um, so if that is why he's doing that behavior, stopping him or redirecting him can actually cause him to become dysregulated mm -hmm. or to think he's doing something wrong by trying to soothe himself. Um, it could just simply also be a two-year-old, hey, is this going to do the same thing each and every time? Yes. <laughs> so we I, don't know for sure. Yeah. He, this is something he does all of the time. I mean, okay. he, he opens and closes the refrigerator just constantly. And not only in his own house, wherever there's a refrigerator, he will do that. And, but anyway, I don't want to get off the subject. I am the one who is going to do revealing secrets and skeletons in the closet. And I have written my memoir. So I really commend you and, and support you in every way of doing that. And I know you're going to do a beautiful job. Thank you. And I am interested in hearing a little bit more about your presentation, like when it is, where it is, if you don't mind sharing. Um, I don't, I have one scheduled in May right now, and now I'm starting to set up others oh. to do presenting, but you can, um, um, you can look me up on Facebook okay. it's, uh, or my website is just maryhavens.com okay, and I am on Facebook. You. So, and I know Elizabeth for several years now. Yeah, maybe we need to have you on here to explain that more, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Not like you're busy enough, right? <laughs> well, it's it's finally coming together. And, uh, you know, when you write your story and you tell your story and like you, um, I'm much older than you, but my kids, my daughters, they were sexually abused by their father. And so the ramifications of that and all of my red flags or my you know, antennas go up all the time. And, and so now it's grandkids and, and my protective shields come out, but they don't always appreciate or know sure. that I'm just trying to protect those little ones. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, I, I know what you're referring to, Mary. I, I thought, Donna, that you said it was a longer word. I thought the end of it was mute something. Oh, selective mutism or situational okay. mutism. Okay. Sorry, it used to be called selective. So I'm still trying to break myself of that. Sure. Um, the situational mutism is often with comes with an internal presentation of autism. And I have that internal presentation more. Um, that is common for, um, you know, often for people who are assigned girl at birth or people who are non-binary or, um, you know, quiet, quieter boys, et cetera, um, for people who are assigned boy at birth. And it just means that like from, I'll tell you my experience of it, because I can only talk from my experience Sure, truly is like if. I am feeling profoundly unsafe. It's basically a freeze response in my nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, it's like all the words get stuck here and they leave my head and I literally cannot talk. Sure. Um, it doesn't happen so much as an adult. And I know ways to go, like how to get around it now. But as a child, I didn't know that. I just knew I suddenly couldn't talk. And of course, you know, that suited my teacher just fine mm -hmm. if I was unable, too afraid to talk, sure. um, the teacher who abused me. But like for my whole kindergarten year, I don't think I talked once in the classroom because I felt so unsafe with all those kids around, with all the noise. My friend talked for me. <laughs> yeah. I had a good friend who pretty much knew what I wanted and needed, and she talked for me. So I didn't really need to. <laughs> wow. But look where you are today. Yes. You I know, are educating amazing. all of us. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I just, I, I have ever since I was, I was, especially when I was abused by my teacher, I wanted to be the teacher I needed. I wanted to be the adult I needed. And I became that like when I became an adult. Yes, I, you did. I have always strived to do for kids, what I wish had been done for me, not, nobody did it out of, I don't believe anyone other than my teacher who abused me mm -hmm. and her enablers were doing anything out of malice. I think mm -hmm. like other people just didn't know. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and didn't know how to go about 
saying things to me or asking things. Um, my first grade, the teacher I'd had for first grade was absolutely phenomenal. When I was quiet in her class, she found out I wanted to be a teacher and she had me help her like put together packets for the other kids and stuff um, after school. But, you know, her classroom door was open and anybody could come in, et cetera. So it was a different situation. <clears throat> and she found out I could be very talkative when I felt safe. <laughs> Yeah. And then once I felt comfortable talking with her, I started speaking up in class. Well, she noticed something was going on um, because I wasn't myself anymore at school. Um, I had started, like, I would yell at my teacher sometimes, sure. like on the playground, because I was so mad at her, um, especially if she yelled at me, I'd sometimes yell right back at her. Mm -hmm. And that teacher knew that wasn't like me. Um. So one time after an assembly, when my teacher in, you know, where whole school's in there, she pulled me onto her lap. Um, that other teacher, my first grade teacher, um, Mrs. Kin's father had come over to me and pulled me aside afterward. Um, she had her class just wait and she asked if I was okay. And I told her no. And I saw my teacher looking at us and coming over and she said, can you talk to me about it? And I looked at my teacher coming over and I was like, no. And so she told me that I was always welcome in her classroom and that I could tell her anything. So she tried. I was just too scared of my teacher to do anything. Um, she did the best. I think Mrs. Kid's father did the best she could in that moment. Sure. Uh, and I am so grateful for her for leaving that door open for me. I think what would have helped me is if she had been able to like pull me aside at a recess one day when I was out and she was out and when my teacher wasn't and checked on me then I think I may have been able to say something mm -hmm. um, or I don't know maybe she did say something to the counselor I don't know but you know knowing that leaving the door open for a kid is very helpful. And then what I wished she had done, um, I tried to do for kids. And I just always try to keep an eye on all the adults, mm -hmm. as well as the kids as much as I could. Like I monitored who was supposed to be out at recess and where they were. Like I was counting kids when I was on recess duty. Oh. And if there was a kiddo missing, because I, I got to know all the kids really quickly. Um, and if there's a kid I'm missing, I would try to find out where so-and-so was. Probably was me, me being paranoid, but I kept an eye on the kids. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's what kids need. I mean, it's just an incredible gift that you have. And, you know, I have to say, uh, when we met or over Zoom a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to you, I got off the out of the meeting and I was like, gosh, I like her. And, and tonight, um, listening to you and, and all that you've, you know, gone through everything that you have done, um, all your work that you're doing, I just have this unbelievable amount of respect for you. Um, we are coming to an end here pretty quick, but I was wondering if there's any survivors out there listening tonight who maybe hasn't um, ever told anyone, I mean, even as an adult, uh, which we know that a lot of survivors haven't told uh, when they, and a lot of times they aren't even um, dealing with it until they're well into their mid years. Um, is there any kind of wisdom that you'd want to throw their way or something that you'd like to say to them that might sure. help them? Here, I'm, sure. I'm kind of putting pressure on you. <laughs> That's okay. The first thing I want to say is I believe you. That is something every survivor needs to hear. Mm -hmm. I believe you. And that is something that if a kiddo ever comes to you and discloses you, you need to tell them, I believe you. Yes. Um, that is huge. So first, I believe you. And second, if you cannot find the words yet, that's okay. You will know when it is right for you. Um, sometimes it helps to draw and make other types of art because some things are too hard to put into words. And so they can come out artistically. 
And then you may find the, cur the courage and the words that you need to tell, but only do it when the time is right for you and only you know when that is. I also recommend writing unsent letters, like letters that you'll never send. Um, I write them to my abuser sometimes when I get really upset with her and mm -hmm. I just let it all out. <laughs> Tell her what's, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me to feel like I'm taking my power back. So if you need to do that for a while, do that. If you need to write letters to younger you, which has been very helpful for me too, I would recommend you do that. Like tell your younger self that you believe her. Oh, that's so important. And that she did not deserve what happened to her, that she is not at fault, yeah. et cetera. That can also make it a little bit easier to disclose to someone else because you've already shown yourself the same compassion that hopefully whomever you disclose to will show to you. But it one thing essential with healing is self-compassion and self-love. Um, it took me working on, I do the one little word for the year and my word for last year was love. But I'm very good at being loving to others. I wasn't as good at being loving to myself. So for that whole year, I focused more on self-love and it worked. I learned how to love myself, love as uh, started with loving my inner child, because, oh my goodness, you know, if a little kiddo who I knew came to me and told me this story, I would feel so much compassion and so much love mm -hmm. for them. So how could I deny that to the younger version of me? Yeah. Um, I looked at pictures of me from then and had like, I printed one out that I put, I made this little binder for my healing work and I put it in the binder. So I saw it pretty much every day. Sure. And I would look at it while I wrote the letters to my younger self. And it just, that amount of self-love and self-compassion is incredibly healing. And it helps give you the confidence to do things that you thought you couldn't. Like write my middle grades draft, start my memoir. Those are things I thought I would never be able to do. They're things I wanted to do. But fear was holding me back. However, I found that as I learned to love myself, I can no longer deny myself things that have been my dreams. Because I loved myself too much to deny it. I Anyhow. love that. I love that. And and I think, you know, that big piece of self-acceptance and self-love. I mean, so many of us, you know, it's it's incredible. You, you mentioned, you know, how how thoughtful you can be to a little one or how caring to a little one, but how awful we can be to ourselves sometimes. So that loving yourself and, and having compassion for that little person inside. Um, I mean, that's when I think we really start to make leaps and bounds and, and in, in our healing journey. Um, I just have to say it was such a pleasure to have you tonight. I want to thank everybody uh, that came tonight and, and listened and um, was part of the program. Thank you so much. But Donna, I cannot wait to hear what you end up doing next. I hope that you stay in touch and, uh, you know, uh, reach out periodically because I, I, I just, I love your spirit. You're such a kind hearted person with so much knowledge and I really appreciate it. And uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you to all of you who attended and wrote in the chat and everything. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You have a wonderful night. And thanks again for um, being a part of Conversations with Elizabeth. Again, if you want to learn more about Empower Survivors, you can go to www.empowersurvivors.net. Uh, there you'll also find that we're having a couple events in April, a uh, fun, fundraising event at the end of the month where we're going to have um, games, silent auctions, raffles, all these types of things, music, food, uh, everything to have a good time. And at the beginning of April, we're having a meat raffle. So come on out. Uh, it's going to be at Big Guy's uh, Barbecue and Roadhouse in Hudson, Wisconsin, but I invite everybody to stop on out and be social and, and eat some food. 
<laughs> but thank you again, Donna. I hope you thank have you. a wonderful night. And again, stay in touch. I'd love to um, keep that door open. So absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Donna. Right. Thank Bye. you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah.